Well, I guess we just want to dive right in. We have we have 30 minutes, which I'm sure will pass very quickly. I've had the pleasure of meeting you all before. We've already had a bit of a chat around the MLM. I think we got very excited about doing that in the kind of UX, DX forum, where we're thinking a lot about products, the, the really kind of big view on ML. I think some people in our audience today will be thinking, wow, I, I think this is something I might might be part of my life or my company's life over the next few years. But maybe we could start with something quite general, which is... Uh, um, ML, not, not all products have ML. There was a time where most products didn't have uh, machine learning, um, but now more and more products have. So how do you orient yourself in that space? And how do you decide, is ML what we're going to do here uh, on this product? Maybe, Katerina, I might start with you. Yeah, absolutely. I'm uh, really passionate about this topic, and I'm glad that you asked I think often ML is uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence is used like buzzwords. And the thinking about implementing it starts from the direction, let's do artificial intelligence or machine learning, and then we will find the use case. Instead, also what we talked about in our talk is very important to think about the use case. What is the customer problem or business problem that you're trying to solve? because all of them, uh, all those solutions come with the cost. So instead, I think it's super important to think within your context, within your product, what are the problems that you're trying to solve and maybe solve them with machine learning or solve them with better user experience or maybe solve that with uh, better customer care. There might be different solutions. Just treat machine learning uh, from my perspective as one of the tools to solve those problems. Yeah, I, I know that myself, having coming up as a, as a data scientist and doing a PhD, you come into industry and you're like, right, show me the data science problem, I'll solve it. And they're like, mm, it's a little bit more complicated because there's multiple ways we could solve this problem. We need to decide. And then you realize, oh, the world is more complex than I thought it was. And that's why we need that real cross-functional mix. Um, and Dana, I, I was looking, I, I listened to your talk earlier and you were... Um, talking a lot, maybe even more on that technical side, that it isn't just an algorithm you might need. You actually need to assemble quite quite a different way of working to some traditional software engineering if you want to go down that route. And that has a lot of implications in itself about how you uh, set up and invest. Yeah, for sure. So I think, um, as uh, Katerina said, sometimes we, we could follow the trap where we say, hey, we will just develop a machine learning model here. Uh, and then uh, besides not figuring out the use case, you also realize that you need some components of infrastructure to actually deploy it, to retrain it, to maintain it. Um, yeah, um, how to say, up to speed with new patterns. So I think we sometimes uh, forget about that, that part. Um, also, um, one of my learnings is that um, maybe maybe our products uh, or our systems, as we build them for many years, they are not ready to absorb machine learning models or predictions from machine learning models. And I think this is also an area that requires a bit of uh, maybe uh, changing skills or how we look at our products. And this is. Uh, like an invitation, not only for engineers, but it's also an invitation for, for designers and product managers to help in, yeah, embedding machine learning in user jobs and workflows. Yeah, so for sure, it's, it's about those people and then there's infra and then there's actually building the product itself. So there's a mo bunch of things to get right. And I think all of you have talked to me previously and mentioned in your talks that there's a secret in AI. A lot of the projects are not successful. And that's this kind of open secret because there is research is necessary in order to, to, to create these AI products. And research inher inherently involves experimentation and failure. So for any company that's looking at it and looking at the bottom line and looking at timelines, they'll really want to you know, maximize their chances of success. I know, um, uh, Maya, this is something that you looked at, especially from a learning perspective. You're trying to think what, 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 what makes a good team, what makes a good set of stakeholders, what makes a positive collaborative interaction. Maybe you could talk a little bit about what, what you feel makes it a really good environment for uh, machine learning to flourish and maybe what might not be so, so good an environment. 
Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, no, I think it's really important in the way that we've approached it was uh, look at the large picture and consider like who are the people that are involved in decisions around uh, making machine learning work um, overall. I think that that's the part that we really try to emphasize is that it should be everybody actually along the whole process, uh, all the business stakeholders, um, and they all need to have a really common language um, to be able to explore this as a solution uh, to a problem, as a possibility, um, and have the ability to decide, is machine learning actually a good solution to this problem, or can we find other ways um, to solve this? So I think that, I think it's really important providing the skill sets and the ability for everybody to take part in that initial converse conversation and it will save so much time and headache uh, to talk about these things and kind of uh, start from a really good place from the from the very beginning then kind of uh, encounter this later down the line. So that you, you mentioned something really there that really tickled me. I, I really, really like this idea of this, a stakeholder responsibility to use a shared language to talk cross-functionally about the product. And I guess, um, Dana, that was, that's sometimes a challenge for engineers, right? To, to use business language and to use a vernacular cross-business language rather than what they might be used to in more technical circles. Yeah, well, I think uh, nowadays, um, like communication skills for engineers and data scientists are uh, super important. And it's something that we value uh, a lot. So, yeah, I, th I think, uh, you know, the industry changed a bit. Um, and yeah, I, I can't say I've seen this as a challenge for us. As long as we facilitate that discussion and we created the forum for stakeholders and engineers to meet, then uh, yeah, usually the results are good. I think, I think that's the unifying thing I've heard across all your talks is just create the right forum, create the right arena. And actually it's not too hard to do the right things once, once the environment seems um, correct and you have some standards and norms kind of established or, or cultural ways of working. But um, I think it's also to, mm. to complement what Dana said, it's about yeah. what are the discussion topics in, that, mm -hmm. uh, in those uh, cross-functional discussions. Uh, and uh, that's uh, what also I believe by giving, uh, uh, by both educating business stakeholders, but also engineers and for engineers to know that they can use and discuss different aspects with business stakeholders, but also discussing the cost of machine learning or artificial intelligence, what are the risks, what are the challenges and what are the benefits by having the talking points uh, aligned across different stakeholders and groups within the company, then you can have much better result because that also opens up for creativity. If you already know that you got the foundation across different functions, then you can build on top of that and focus on the content rather than trying to figure out what's the format of the discussion. Yeah, I, like, I really like some, something you just said there, Ekaterina, about the um, about, about the, the the what what about how we structure what the activity that we're trying to do. So, what are we trying to learn? What how we do we make best use of our resources? And if you talk in terms like that, I think you can realize that like research and machine learning development can be quite similar to product management in, in, in that sense, where you you have hypotheses, you you want to test and try and figure out as you go. Do you have that same view? Is that how you feel? You know, I generally, uh, I'm following the philosophy that many things uh, can be thought of as a product management. Uh, and mm -hmm. in that sense, absolutely. I think uh, research, and in, in that sense, I think machine learning and product management, since machine learning solves a specific problem, that's pretty much the same processes. We have a problem to solve or the need to solve. We have a hypothesis and then we need data to validate that. And I think in that sense, uh, it's very much aligned. So I'm uh, uh, very much in favor of using this, that thinking and also learning from failures because then you can put that learning back into the process and improve in future iterations on what you are doing and maybe decide not to use machine learning after all. Yeah, well, that, that option could always be on the table and you may even find yourself going back there after getting your, 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 your feet wet. So um, 
maybe on that topic so um how, how do you check yourself along the way right so if you're taking a product manager point of view you might think how do we pause pivot stick or twist or you know that kind of idea but also similarly on the ml your first model doesn't work maybe as well as you thought how do you how do you find yourself you can suddenly find yourself with a very big decision do we stick with this and uh, and keep going or do we maybe take a step back is it is it standard product management practices or something specific you would do for ml and uh, maybe i'll just get dana's perspective on, on, on that first yeah i think um in product it's a bit easier and maybe less costly to experiment you know make something uh, and ship it to production and um test it receive feedback while with machine learning i think the experimentation part takes much more time and it's more costly um so yeah i don't i don't think i have a straight answer um i think we in our case so my teams work in the fraud detection space so if, how to say we have already a few good use cases for machine learning so we don't feel like we have to validate our idea our our, mm. our idea and like use cases are very solid um but yeah, i imagine that could be a challenge in in other use cases so maybe maya or katerina can share how did you validate your idea yeah Mm. I I can I can share a little bit about like from the perspective of um also what we try to teach in the course. I think when it comes to pivoting or um thinking of like well how do we adjust? I think it's really about setting up really good metrics and um from from the very beginning of uh of a project and I think that's um that's at least the emphasis for us was like how do we also um empower everybody to understand um to some level machine learning metrics which can be a very technical topic um and empower business stakeholders to kind of understand how these metrics translate to business uh, metrics which are not the same and how these can be uh, used as proxies so i i think for from the perspective of the course that we're teaching i, I think that decision lies in like establishing really good metrics uh for your product um, that uses machine learning and kind of constantly checking yourself there and i think oh. on top of that uh, uh just to add also it's mm. uh, metrics come from your decision what you optimize for uh, when we designed the flow for the course about machine learning when i think it, when i was in a similar project as uh, dana described uh, where you uh, you are actually implementing the model to solve a real problem you need to decide what you optimize for and what is your how does your success look uh, look like and then based on that you can devise the metrics and then see across the project across the development whether you really are achieving what you want to achieve and then be able to have a retrospective whether if you don't achieve what you aim to achieve how can you adapt to that and what do you need to do what uh, out of pivoting stopping or maybe scaling it up what is the right action for the circumstances yeah i i guess something i i would have seen before is, is something very similar to that because if we're in a very data oriented land then if we can find a way of measuring success with metrics that could be very helpful but i think something i found uh, i'm interested to see um just you know ask people what their experiences are it's so fascinating but when the, when you think the machine learning kpis are the same as the business kpis but they actually turn out not to be aligned at all it's the the, the machine learning kpis are quite technical in some sense and when you look at does this actually solve the business problem or we need some different type of kpi framing or, or around that sorry i've just lost my mouse a second okay there we go it's back it was on the other screen um i i wonder dana do you find that having to separate say your technical kpis from your business kpis when you think of uh, progress and success with your teams Mm, we we are trying to to align them and we are trying to yeah because i think if if they're not aligned or if there is no link between them um yeah it doesn't seem right um so for example um 
when it comes to detecting fraud, uh, we we are able to say with this new model, uh, we will be able to, I don't know, capture this time of fraud and in these numbers. So those are the, the results that we expect. And then once we ship it, uh, yeah, we monitor ourselves against that expectation. Sometimes uh, our expectations are, or the results are better than our expectations. Um, so when it comes to fraud detection, I think that's very, very in line with the business KPIs. Um, but I can imagine um, uh, being a bit harder, for example, when you have models that look for sentiment. Um, so, yeah. Having, having, having worked on a sentiment analysis myself in the past, like I, I can relate to that. You can have the, 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 the best performing sentiment model in the world, but you might not have a product. <laughs> There's, there's much more needed to understand what the application specifically is. Um, so one of the things maybe more on the challenging side is, is I think we talked already about having fertile growth for teams and, and, for, and for product development. Um, there is kind of one, I guess, role within the mix, which is either a data scientist or an ML engineer, which is often very important in, in developing an AI product. Um, they can be they can be reasonably hard to find, you know, high quality candidates. Uh, I'm wondering, um, uh, Maya, have, have you have you come across that challenge before? Um, is that something? Um, how would you recommend people might might come against that, that issue? It's a good question. Um, I would really say that I think almost any expertise uh, around machine learning, whether that's data scientists, machine learning engineers. PMs with machine learning experience, uh, researchers uh, who are well-versed with machine learning is hard to come by. So any of the folks with that experience are really a scarce resource right now. Uh, I think this is also why it, we at Spotify decided that it was really good investment of our time to actually create a training because we have amazing people internally and uh, we wanted to make sure that we can upskill them uh, and empower them to use um, this new technology. Um, so I think the focus for us was um, how do we use this training to kind of provide the skills necessary as quickly as possible and in a practical way. Um, and uh, the way we thought about it at least was like, you know, we're not going to teach everything about machine learning because that's, that's a huge scope, but how can we really focus on like our internal use cases um, and empower data scientists that maybe um, don't have as much ML experience or um, other engineers, backend engineers that um, can support machine learning engineers in their teams to gain some of those um, like skills uh, in order to kind of lift everybody and move forward without um, you know competing only for the scarce resource, which we continue to also do. But I think um, internally we decided it was a good investment to also just try to upskill everybody in the same time. Yeah, I, I think I think that's a really good idea because then sort of earlier on in the process you can have more skills in the mix to make some data driven decisions even without maybe your target te team there, which is obviously much more efficient and allows much more activity within the company. I think very related to that, we have an, a question from the floor um, who wants to pull on a thread from Dana earlier, where we said where we talked about how one of the characteristic differences between product development and say more technical ML development is that research um, phases or iterations or experiments in ML can be can take a long time and it can actually be quite expensive to ex execute. So the question is, maybe there's something we can do, but what can we do before that to try and de-risk given that that might be an expensive exercise? Um, Dana, it's, it's comments on, on, on your point. So do you wanna jump in first? Yeah, so I think, um, well, if you have the data, you, you or yeah, you should spend more time in um, analytics, like trying to uh, predict what would be the outcome, uh, try different variables, uh, different features, more features, less features, and then compare the results. So and I, I think maybe also to add to that, uh, I think the... Um, I cannot help but link it back to product management. Can you somehow validate this hypothesis in a, in a cheap way? So if you, can you create manual processes? Is it expensive? 
where is the expensive part comes in? Is it, you know, that you have not enough data or data is not in a good uh, state? Or is it that you're not sure whether that will solve the problem? So addressing the biggest risk and maybe trying maybe manual processes to validate that uh, or trying to look at the analytics, that can help to de-risk a bit that large expense. And then really challenging yourself whether you do need to train that model or can you solve the same need with a different way? But I think also what Dana said is... uh, is really valuable with uh, with analytics and educating stakeholders to look into analytics. I think so, sometimes people could think, "Oh, I'm going too fast. I, I'm 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 a startup. I'm on the hi- I'm on the highway. I don't have time for analytics." But actually, they're going to slow themselves down, right? Because they they leave themselves really open to kind of not seeing what's in front of them and and going down dead end and, and that kind of thing. I, I would like to challenge that because I think. Uh, that's uh, for, for the startups and for the fast moving companies, looking at the data is at the core of that. Because if you are not looking at the data, you might go very far in the wrong direction. So I actually mm. think that assumption that not looking at analytics uh, is uh, can lead to the wrong way. But the key is to balance how much you invest into that and how much mm-hmm. can you move, uh, move fast uh, while balancing the investment. Yeah, so that, that's that's exactly it, isn't it? Being able to balance and kind of just be cognizant of what you're doing and, and what you're investing in and the cost of that. I really like the point you made as well, just about characterizing your risk. So from a product point of view, what are we worried about here? Is it feasibility? Is it viable? Is it not a big enough market for this? Or or which is which part of that product uh, opportunity are we really worried about? If it's feasibility, then maybe it doesn't need a technical exercise to verify that it would work. But another time, it might be a different type of validation required. Um, th- thanks for your answers there to that question from the audience. Um, I'm just doing a time check. We're at 22 past, so we, st- we still have a small bit of time. Um, maybe we'll just take a, a, a quick turn to the more um, the more risky side. So, and I, I want to ask a little bit about what we might call pitfalls or common traps, or maybe there's something you'd like to highlight from either your own experience or your knowledge of the industry uh, relating to um, things to watch out for if if you're new to putting together a team or a project in AI or ML. Um, maybe um, who wants to take that? Uh, Maya, do you want to have a stab at that one? Um, sure. I mean, I I can't. I've not, I've not led machine learning projects, so my experience would be more about like how do we communicate such a uh pitfalls of such experience past experience through the courses that we teach um so i think i think an interesting topic in this area that i think all of us um uh, have to tackle um with machine learning projects um in general is um how do we uh, work with um, algorithmic bias that gets um, fed into the data and the different um, ways that that um, kind of seeps in to our machine learning models. Um, so uh, from the perspective of the courses that we teach, um, we really highlight uh, this and spend a great deal of time um, talking to all of our stakeholders. It's usually a very debated topic and it's always really interesting to have those conversations out um, and again providing the space for engineers and data scientists and designers and uh, product managers to actually talk about this um, and really consider how um, different uh, data can um, introduce bias, but also how different metrics can introduce bias and all the different places where this can happen along your developmental cycle is really interesting, I think, uh, to consider. And, you know, how what are what are our internal also like best practices at Spotify? Um, we have an algorithmic bias team that really works hard to, to you know, kind of... Um, give us the best tools available to to really um, deal with um, with that. So I think also like making sure that people are really aware what are our best practices um, to avoid such pitfalls and how to reach out to teams that are experts in, in these areas and, and use those resources. I think it's really, really important. There are a lot of people, I think, 
that have learned things from the past. So making sure that that knowledge is contained within your organization and is shared around is really, really crucial, I think. Uh, because as you said, like there's a lot of experimentation, but if we are not learning collectively out of it, I think it's a, it's a lost opportunity. And I think the culture of learning is also very important that uh, in... Um, many companies really embrace this uh, no blame culture, but instead learning from the experience and building on top of that. And I think that's also a key component that uh, you could evaluate and then reflect what went wrong and when. Uh, and another also uh, another part of what we where you could bring uh, people together and help them to find the riskier parts is when you talk about success metrics or success criteria. What's your how does success look like? But you can also talk about how disaster looks like because that's also very important to be frank uh, at the very early discovery stage, not to kill the idea, but really to be aware uh, by what risks you can encounter. And then you can put in guardrail metrics or you can check your data for bias or your data for um, maybe misrepresentation of your customer base or you could also work really closely with engineers and really find together solutions to address those risks. Because otherwise, if you just hand it over and then say train the model without addressing more holistic perspective, you wouldn't be as successful. It seems a little bit similar what you're talking there to this idea of a pre-mortem of like just pitching yourself in the future and, and, and just imagining what, what am I trying to figure out? Place yourself in the future. Something's gone wrong. What is this? to try and really kind of grab us concretely. Um, Dan, in, in your presentation, one of the things I really, really like to get a little bit more technical down at the business end, one of the points you were driving home or the lessons was, you're really going to need to test this stuff before it goes out. You might find yourself doing data quality testing, doing dry runs, doing kind of beta test. Like the, it's often hard to get a, an observation of the system that gives you enough guarantee that you need um, to, to release. Uh, maybe you could talk a little bit uh, about that in terms of pitfalls. Yeah, so when it comes to uh, like things to watch for, I'll, I'll present the execution part. Uh, so data engineering is something to watch for. It's usually something that I, th I believe it's, it's underestimated in machine learning uh, objectives. Um, and uh, the next one is uh, like how you, how you tested um, like, yeah, how you enable the dry run for how long, who is looking at the results, uh, um, and then the, the quality checks or data validation. I think a risk or a pitfall that we discovered is that um, we want more tools available for us uh, to do that. So this is also uh, something that could prolong uh, machine learning objectives, um, yeah longer than expected. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and, and even if anyone's worked in the field for the last couple of years, there's so much more tools than there were even three or four years ago to support these. So long, long may that continue. Um, we have one, I have time for one quick question from the floor, and then we might just have a, a final kind of uh, around the table. Um, for uh, Ekaterina and Maya, um, there was, we talked a little bit about kind of training programs and rollouts, maybe for those companies that will be working with a smaller number of employees, maybe less than 50 employees, maybe how would, might they adopt some of your um, approaches and, and learnings from education, but in a smaller environment with, a, with a, only maybe one or two teams of engineers or product managers? Um, I think that... Um... So first thing I think that you need to um, assess is whether you have internal expertise um, to, to kind of really share across your organization. And most of the time there is uh, such expertise, even if it's quite scarce, um, getting those people um, on board and finding out whether they can share some of uh, their learnings and experience um, is a really powerful way because you could really relate directly to the use cases in your organization. Um, I think that's probably the best way. And then the second thing is if you find that there isn't internal expertise is finding best uh, probably uh, outside solutions to really bring that expertise to your team. I think that's uh, the second, and which happens actually quite often early on in, in organizations. So. 
So for you find finding the support that you need if you, if you don't think you have it in house is a really important message. Yeah. So we might just close, but maybe give you each maybe uh, to those in the audience that are just new to ML, they're going to get their toes wet. Uh, maybe one line of um, inspiration or, or advice you, you, you might leave them with. I might start with you, Dana. Yeah, so we discussed at the beginning that it's important to find the use case. But if finding the use case takes you, I don't know, one year, I would recommend to just try it. Even though you will fail, you will learn so much from it. Absolutely. Yeah. Embrace failure and learning. Uh, for sure, and uh, focus on use case. Katerina? I, my advice is opposite of Dana's. Uh, find, <laughs> <laughs> think about your customer needs and your use case and really challenge yourself whether you need machine learning. You will always be able to build that out and build the competence, but uh, is it really the worth cause right now to spend your time and effort? <laughs> I think already we see the benefit of having the right language and having the debate back and forth about what the right thing to do is the microcosm of it here. Um, the, and then Maya, final thoughts. I'll, I'll be on the balance. Uh, no, I, my, my final words would be really um, think about machine learning as like something that everybody can do and participate in a conversation. I think it's often taught as very technical subject. And I think it's really, really important that everybody understands that it's not actually um, something only preview to data scientists and machine learning engineers. Yeah, I think we see the thread holding all of that together is, is how we deal with experimentation as a kind of a way of working and how we manage that in the business, not in a real top down way, but in a way that we can manage it ourselves in teams. So I just want to close by thanking everyone, uh, Maya, Dana, Katerina, I really enjoyed the chat and I also really enjoyed talking with you before this as well and, and learning from your experiences. I watched your presentations twice, they were great. Um, we'll be hanging around the Slack, I think, for any, any follow-up questions. I'll, I'll keep an eye on if anyone wants to tag me for anything. And I really want to thank the organizers as well for inviting us today. I really appreciate the opportunity.